I would now like to introduce Ed Kamatali, uh, the Associate Vice Provost for Arts and Humanities and the Director for the IU Bloomington Arts and Humanities Council. Ed is also a faculty co-chair and represents PLACE. Thank you. Uh, you're all very far away, you know that, right? Uh, <laughs> should I detach Mike and do this lounge singer style, <laughs> moving amongst the tables? Yeah, I'd love that. Uh, uh, thank you, thanks for coming out today. Uh, before I start, I just wanna say that my, my partner uh, in this initiative is Adrian Starnes. He's sitting in the back of the room here. We are true equals in this initiative, and even though I'm speaking today, we work very closely together. This, Working this area is like playing piano with four hands, and I, I definitely need his help uh, along the way. So I just want to thank Adrian for that. You could ask him as many questions as you could ask me as we go on. Um, I plan to talk just a little bit about uh, the process to got to, that got us to where we are today uh, and some of the work that we're doing in, in three towns uh, in southern Indiana. Um, I had more fun than ever putting together this, this PowerPoint because these are some of the people that we've met uh, in communities throughout southern Indiana. We spent about a year and a half uh, on a listening tour, that's what I call it. Um, it's, it's particularly important in arts administration uh, to listen to the people uh, that you want to work with, to listen to their needs, uh, to listen to their dreams, uh, and to hear about the problems that, that they're experiencing. Uh, this is particularly important in Indiana uh, a notoriously flat state. Um, I think it's, it's flatness uh, masks a lot of complexity. Uh, it's also a state where the people uh, express a great humility and very difficult to get them to speak up about the things that they're proud of. Uh, so this listening tour was, was all important. We spoke with mayors, we spoke with educators, we spoke with arts programmers, uh, we spoke with students. Uh, we wanted to hear from everyone we could possibly hear from in order to, to help them figure out what they think of as, as, as quality of place. Um, very important for us. Uh, I remember a very early conversation with the Parks and Rec Director in uh, Salem, Indiana. We were talking about uh, two young men who wanted to put a, a bike trail uh, in their community, and they were being fought by local residents uh, who were afraid of the danger, uh, the dangerous elements it might bring to town. Uh, and I asked her, what, what was the worry here? Uh, and they, she said they just want to protect their town. And I said, what do they want to protect? And she said, well, what's here? And I said, well, what's here? And it's a very difficult conversation to get to the to bottom of what is, what is actually valued in these communities, and particularly what, it, what is valued in terms of, of art and culture uh, and expression. Um, so this, this was, a, it was a task, and it was a really interesting one. And, and we learned. We learned how to talk to, to Hoosiers. Uh, I've been on this campus for 18 years, uh, mostly in Bloomington, uh, stayed in Bloomington, and, and to be able to get out there and, and to learn how to communicate with people um, that are not from IU and have no uh, sense that they might ever be at IU is, is a difficult challenge. But we learned to be patient, we learned to build trust, we showed a lot of neighborliness. Um, I would often leave these towns with a fresh loaf of bread under my arm from someone who made it for us. Uh, we invited them to campus. Uh, and, and we created friendships um, along the way. And these people are all incredibly important to me. Um, respect is essential here. Uh, and also uh, gratitude. I, I think those are some things that we've learned that the people we interact with really value. Um, they are incredibly grateful for the interest that we ex express in them at all. Uh, whether we do anything to help them out, um, they often express disbelief that we're even interested uh, in, in them and their lives. So um, it's incredibly rewarding uh, work down there talking to these people. I think the real breakthrough came when we decided to set up local steering committees. Um, there were sort of uh, leaders, sort of informal leaders, unofficial leaders in each of the towns uh, that we liked working with, and we empowered them as a steering committee for us. Uh, we invited them to campus, we showed them the work that we do, and we gave them the chance to speak for us to their, their neighbors. And that just opened up so many amazing and interesting networks for us in these towns. Um, to empower people like that was, was key, I think, to, to all our work. Um, as we went through the, the different counties, we, we encountered many of the same problems um, along the way. Um, these, you know, I'm, I'm from Queens. Uh, I'm used to buses. Uh, there are no buses down there. 
Uh, I'm at IU, I'm used to the internet, there is no internet down there. Um, all the stuff I rely on here on campus for arts programming is not available to me there. You can't do email blasts, there's no traffic patterns. Um, all that stuff is, is, is gone. Um, and it's a really different world um, to operate in, and it's a very isolated world. Um, a lot of the people we talk about are worried about the economy. Uh, the towns that we're in are experiencing full employment, which means that there are no jobs and there's no movement and there are no people coming there. There are no businesses opening up there. And when they think about the arts and culture of the town, they ask us, can we use that to kind of round out the culture of the region, uh, to create cultural experiences that they can then use to attract businesses, to attract new residents. There's a very direct impact for them to be able to say, we now have a cinema series. We now have an outdoor pavilion that plays music. That stuff means a lot. Uh, when you're trying to attack pe attract people to a town that only has 4,000 residents in it. Um, also, connections to IU are, are strange. I mean, I thought I'd see IU everywhere in Southern Indiana. I see it nowhere in Southern Indiana. Um, I don't see recruiters. Um, I don't see a lot of correspondence. Um, IU is a strange entity to a lot of people, and particularly to young people, um, a lot of them don't think of IU as a destination uh, anymore. Uh, and that's something that we had to kind of work against uh, because we're strangers and we're weirdo professors and we're talking about the arts and uh, we have to build a lot of trust in that regard as well. And then finally, uh, resources and capacity. Uh, these towns are strapped just to get their, um, their, their roads clean, to get their graveyards mowed. Um, they don't have people around who can lead arts programs at all. Um, this woman who's the communications director in Huntingburg um, she's also the Parks and Rec director. She's also our main contact. Um, she is incredibly overworked uh, and it's really hard to get on her schedule. Uh, capacity building is absolutely essential in this area. Um, so anyway, these were the things that we were hearing over and over again. And we started developing a plan. Uh, the theme for us over and over again was horizons. Uh, this just came about naturally. Uh, we wanted IU to be more of a horizon for the people that we were talking to, particularly young people. Uh, and we also wanted Southern Indiana to be more of a horizon for IU faculty and students. Uh, we, we were looking for more traffic between the two places and some, some kind of mutual recognition. Um, in terms of expanding horizons, we really kind of ran with the idea of using the arts. Um, the way that artists allow us to see new possibilities the way that artists allow us to tell new stories, the way that artists can rethink the use of materials or reorganize time and space. These are towns with very limited resources and we just had to think like artists to make do with what was at hand and rearrange it in ways that were more exciting, uh, dynamic for people. Um, this is a, a really interesting print by uh, Gustav Bauman. It's a fabulous, fabulous exhibit at the Brown County Art Gallery. Uh, he is, he's a woodcut artist. Uh, and, and we think about him a lot. He would do this amazing work. He would take photographs of the landscape um, and then he would break them down into just 12 different colors. And each piece of wood was a different color. And he would just roll out these gorgeous prints. And I love the way that he would abstract different colors. And I think that that's, some of, that's the work that we're doing. Every time we go down there, we see something else, some kind of pattern in the landscape. And we abstract that pattern and we try to amplify it uh, and make it more vibrant for people. Um, he's been a great model for us uh, in that regard. And a lot of the programs that we're running do similar work um, when we're in southern Indiana. We, we ultimately settled on three towns, um, Huntingburg, Salem, and Nashville. Um, we're, we're, we're in it for the long term with these guys. Uh, they represent three different types of, I think, small towns in rural America. Uh, they have three different types of, of assets and three different types of problems, it seems to me. Uh, Huntingburg has uh, an amazingly charismatic mayor, Mayor Denny, Denny Spinner. He is, uh, he's very aware of creative placemaking. He's won grants for a new arts pavilion. He's widening the sidewalk so they can have concerts there. Um, he really wants Huntingburg to be a destination town for travelers through the state. Uh, he wants to tap into that uh, French Lake traffic uh, on Saturday afternoons. Um, he's a great guy to work with, and that town is really eager to kind of partner with IU um, on their initiatives to become an up and coming rural town. Uh, Salem is a totally different story. Uh, Salem, Indiana, many, many, uh, it's a family town, uh, lower class town, lower income. Um, it's a town that's lost all its art resources. Um, the people there are very concerned about their children 
and that their children aren't getting the, the, um, the opportunities that they had when they were younger. Um, the schools have been stripped of programs, stripped of resources. Um, they've asked us to come to town and model what it means to have a cultured life, model what it means to appreciate the arts as much as other aspects of life. Um, they're asking us just to demonstrate that so that their kids have some faith in, in, in what they're doing when it comes to arts and culture. Um, and then, of course, you all, you all know Nashville, um, Nashville historic art co colony town, um, increasingly a tourist town, uh, increasingly commercialized, particularly along its main drag. There are a lot of tensions in that town between commerce and craft. There's tensions between the city and the county. Um, it has a very small tax base because most of it is forested. Um, I think most of all, it is a grain a town. It's the oldest town per capita in, in the state. Um, and they have no succession plan whatsoever. The whole town is run by retirees. Um, one of the, my favorite people there, he's the director of the, uh, of the historical society. He said, uh, you know what this town runs on? I said, no, I knew he was setting me up for something. He, says, he said, STP, same 10 people. Um, and I'll never forget that line, because it's true. Every time I go there, I meet the same 10 people um, trying to pull it all together. Um, so we're working with these towns, and we're just at this point right now where we're able to see a kind of comprehensive program in place for them. Um, I'm calling it the Town Engagement Program. Um, and I, we're finally able to, to come up with something like, like a mission statement uh, for, for our work. Um, if you see here, uh, I'm just going to read this if you don't mind. Uh, the mission statement is to help each community create a thriving art and culture infrastructure that, and here's the community side of things. Uh, a, supports local arts and culture institutions. B, encourages community expression and reflection. C, exposes residents to new ideas and experiences. And D, increases local capacity in knowledge, infrastructure, and staffing. That's what we want to see in each of these three towns. And this is a scalable, flexible model. It's also starting to be budgetable. We're starting to understand what this costs for towns of this size. Um, and we're developing this with an eye to kind of rolling it out to places like Batesville and Paoli over time. But our programs have to cut two ways. This is really important to me. Everything that we do in any of these towns also has to have benefits for our faculty and students and our university at the same time. So on the university end of things, we want to create new educational and research opportunities for IU, attract new students and faculty to the work of the CRE, and open up possibilities uh, for funding and other support. I can honestly say that all our programs cut both ways. They do things for students and faculty as much as they do things in, this ta in these towns. Um, and that's really key to all of us on the team. We're about to launch, just for ex example, a new series of artist and writer residencies. We'll have faculty and MFA students working this spring and this summer in these towns. They'll be given space and provision and supplies. Um, they'll have a wonderful opportunity and a new inspirational setting for their work. But at the same time, they're going to be leading workshops. They're going to be giving talks. They're going to have an open studio hours where kids can learn their work. Um, it's going to be a mutual relationship that, that benefits both, both sides in this regard. Um, in what remains, I just want to talk to you about some of the amazing programs because I, I am a, I'm not alone in this, and there are a lot of our partners in the room. We're working with Mather's Museum of World Cultures. We're moving, working with Jacobs, um, Eskenazi, Grunewald Gallery. Um, we have incredible campus partners, and what they've really been able to do is translate the kind of exciting work that they do at First Thursdays and elsewhere on campus into the small town culture um, of Southern Indiana. So in terms of arts and culture infrastructure, um, it's, it's really, when we first started out, we really wanted to avoid a kind of imperial model of like exporting campus culture into these communities. Uh, we didn't just want to plop down a bunch of fabulous Jacobs performances. Um, we, we wanted to respect what was in these towns and help cultivate it from the ground up. Um, over time, we realized neither approach was really going to work. Uh, some of these kids, they've never seen a symphony before. And they don't have a symphony to stage. Right? We, we do just have to bring inspiring arts to these towns because they don't exist there. Right? But we're now developing something in between, a collaborative approach. So when we have an exhibit going up in Brown County or Salem, we always leave room in the exhibit for local artists to show their work as well. Um, when we have performances, we allow workshops alongside them, and we engage students to be involved in those performances as well. Um, this is the collaborative model that allows us to develop our programs with an eye to the public, and allows 
the people who live in these towns to have the experiences of performing or presenting in the way that is professional um, and, and forward thinking. Um, artists exchanges and residencies, arts administration projects. We have had such a great partner in the arts administration program here at IU. For once, uh, for the first thing that they did is that they developed and now launched uh, the first in the country, a rural arts administration certificate. Uh, so much arts administration in this country is based on metropolitan areas, of course, or suburban areas. This is, a this is a certificate that actually explores what it means to create arts programming in rural areas. Um, we're now working to make sure that the certificate is open to local arts leaders throughout Southern Indiana. Not IU students, but people who actually live in these towns and need that training for capacity building. Um, these are some of the amazing projects that they've done uh, in their classes. Um, you see the Salem Community Arts Program, the Center for Rural Engagement Strategic Plan for Huntingburg, Indiana. These are semester-long projects run by teams of students in the Arts Administration Program that do a really great, amazing dive where they compare each town and its resources to towns across the nation and look at granting programs, look at community expression programs, and provide a, a genuine strategic plan um, that you'd otherwise pay thousands and thousands of dollars for if you're a community like this, a workable plan. And now we're starting to see these communities starting to adopt these plans, which is amazing opportunities for our students as well as these communities. Um, in terms of exposure and expansion, this is where I think uh, we speak most directly to the young people in the region. Uh, I, I just cannot believe when I'm at these schools how little opportunity there is for creative expression. Um, and how quickly the interest and the resources drop off. Uh, in the Salem School District's uh, sixth grade band, there might be 60 students. Uh, in ninth grade band, it's down to 25. And when they get to high school, it's nine, 10 students in the band. It's amazing the, the kind of attrition rates. At the same time, kids are being forced to choose careers earlier and earlier, middle school. Um, they're thinking about the sciences. They're thinking about engineering. There's such a STEM push. Um, that they devote all their energies in that direction and they just lop off creative expression um, from that point on. Uh, and this is really, as, a, as an arts educator, as a humanist, this is really, really challenging um, for me uh, to think about um, in those ways. We're, we're hearing from a lot of principals, a lot of superintendents. They've done great work with STEM, but there's always 30% of their students who, who that does not address at all. So right now we're working with the School of Ed on building STEAM programs that, that connect those more artistically minded students to the work um, in STEM. Also, it's important for us with these kids, um, we, we're trying to create pathways. This is like absolutely key. Uh, they, they don't see the arts as a path to anything. Uh, there is no artistic horizon for them. They don't see IU as a destination at all. So when we come in there with programs, particularly music programs or theater programs um, or, or art programs, we make sure that we surround them with workshops and visits and career explanations and give them a sense of how we can connect this glorious artwork or project to an actual life, to an actual career path. Um, my favorite example of this was in the, in the Department of Theater. Um, they wanted to put out a cabaret where they were gonna get their best undergraduate performers. They were each gonna sing a song um, and dazzle the kids throughout the region. Um, but there was something that they felt was falling a little flat with that program. Um, the, the audience seemed too passive. Um, and so what they decided to do was allow the students in the cabaret to each pick a song that reflected their struggle to get to IU, um, and then develop a monologue beforehand that talked about all the opposition they faced as a young artist. Um, and what was amazing about that is just that opened up the performance and it became something that was realizable for students. Um, oh, that's how you do that. That's how you get on that stage. Um, it's important that we've been able to switch these programs and kind of take some of the awe out of them and make them down to earth, realizable goals uh, for kids. So that's exposure and expansion. I know I'm, I'm running out of time here. Self-reflection, self-expression. Um, as I mentioned, the communication systems do not exist. There are not opportunities in these towns for people to come together and think and talk about their past, present, or future. Um, there's very little self-definition um, because that just does not occur, um, at least amongst the people that we are constantly meeting with. And we're trying to build in uh, ways to have these discussions 
um, to get people to start thinking about their goals and talking to each other about them. Um, and this is, there are models about like this, about for this kind of work across the country. One of my favorites is the art of the rural. This is something that came out of the Kentucky Urban Rural Exchange, where you bring together local arts leaders with campus leaders and then national arts programmers. Everyone gets to show off their stuff. You start developing a, a conversation about what's unique about the region's cultural heritage. Um, it's a way of kind of jump-starting conversations in communities that otherwise wouldn't happen. Uh, we're now working on this project, it's called Ghost Labs, um, where we're bringing faculty and local residents into abandoned or otherwise empty sites to talk about the history of that place. A lot of these are workplaces, and we're working with a lot of labor groups. Uh, talk about the DMI factory in Huntingburg, it just closed last summer. What happened here? Why did it happen? What's gonna happen in the future? Um, we're using site-specific kind of activities to just develop the self-consciousness of place. Um, and then finally, uh, capacity building. And this is really kind of, I would say, the end game for all that we're doing. Um, because we want to make sure that these communities are stable and they're able to sustain what we've, what we've created there. Um, if IU has to leave, of course. Um, so we're working with local steering committees, as I said. We're setting up youth arts leadership groups to establish a succession plan for the next generation. Uh, we're partnering with Indiana Arts Commission on a rural entrepreneurship program where IU students will get training from Indiana Arts on local arts uh, and business uh, 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 ventures. Um, those students who come out of IU will train with the IAC and then they'll get a stipend to set up a business in one of these towns. Um, that's another way of developing capacity. We are also, we have a Rural Arts Administration Certificate, uh, and then we're working on regional consortia. Uh, right now we're developing a small theater consortium uh, to connect all the small theaters in Southern Indiana, including the Buskirk Chumley, including IU Theater, so that they can share resources such as lighting technicians, uh, wardrobe uh, seamstresses. We're working really hard to make sure that these theaters can sustain each other by sharing resources um, with each other. And those meetings are going to be housed in our own IU Theater Department. We have some great faculty there who are really committed to small community theaters. So then, just the last slide here is, it's about engaging faculty. Um, we're very lucky in quality of place because we have an Arts and Humanities Council uh, that works really well at collaborative programming. Uh, and the initial charge was, go back to your unit and help us think about programs that would appeal to the Center for Rural Engagement and actually make these impactful changes. So we started off with at great advantage here. We were ready to go. We were doing First Thursdays, Grand Balloon. We, had, we were working on programs of the sort that, that already build, programs that build community. Um, at the same time, we recently received a Mellon grant to open up at an A&H research laboratory that focuses on public humanities. Um, and, and in public humanities, as the way that we understand it, it means, it doesn't just mean dumbing down the humanities for the public. It means bringing the public into the research process. Uh, working with the public to develop research questions, research methods, uh, research deliverables. Um, and so we, we had got a head start with the kind of scholarly work in the region. We just had a round of proposals. We got amazing stuff from IU faculty. My favorite one, uh, Nicole Siegel in the gender department. She's working with prisoners in what is the oldest and largest uh, women's correctional facility um, in Indiana. They're writing an academic monograph together on the history of that facility and the ways in which it has defined female criminality over the past 120 years. Um, she's actually producing that with prisoners. Um, and that kind of stuff is what Indiana Studies at the Mellon Center is doing right now. And we're applying all that great research um, to the region itself. Um, also, it's important that we have common ground projects in the arts. Uh, Betsy Steer at the Grimwald Gallery is putting together a contemporary art exhibit with uh, art faculty members and MFA students. Uh, trying to figure out a theme for this, they ultimately focused on local textiles. Um, they're creating contemporary art based on traditional Hoosier materials and skills and techniques. It's a wonderful crossover program that brings faculty out into the region and has them creating work that speaks to the region. So that's, that's pretty much the presentation. Uh, some of you know um, we received what seemed like uh, 
probably the most inspiring and unreadable letter of all time uh, this past weekend from a band teacher in Salem High School. Um, the, the band program led by Dr. Smedley uh, gave a performance in Salem High School last week. They invited kids from all over the region to attend. Um, they also had workshops that lasted all day. And the band teacher wrote to us, wrote to, to, to IU, and she said in all her life, she's been there for 30 years, she's never had a more inspiring experience with the band. Um, and she mentioned all the ways in which the IU band members sat down one-on-one -on -one with uh, her scared uh, and timid um, and really, at times, incredibly depressed students. Um, and work with them to play, really. And there's one line in there about a, a, a girl who has uh, always wanted to play bassoon and never seen a bassoon, <laughs> that uh, no one's ever donated a bassoon to the school. Uh, and they showed her one. There's a big story about that in the letter. But my favorite was this clarinetist who um, the teacher described as having come from great poverty and a bad life. That's what she said. This is a student, great poverty and a bad life. And she had a solo um, with the band uh, during the performance. And she started off very timidly. And uh, one of the IU students noticed how timid she was and just like gently backed her up, um, played behind her. And the student just filled up with inspiration by that and uh, completed the solo. Uh, it's, it's amazing. Um, a small moment, but an amazing one. And you know, there are all sorts of ways of measuring our work. And I, I don't think that moment is a way of measuring it that's going to get us a lot of funding. Um, <laughs> but um, it's the way that we're measuring it on a day-to-day on -day basis. So um, that's it. That's my presentation. Thanks a lot. For